Well, I tell you what here, you know, just when you think, gosh, you'll be explored everything there is to explore about Christmas, you know, you really find some other things that uh, are extremely important. And, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things that um, comes to mind as I was reading Arnold Fruchtenbaum, uh, he said, um, people talk about the miraculous birth of the Savior, but the birth itself was not terribly miraculous. It was the conception that was miraculous. And so that's true. I mean, it was, a, it was really a miraculous conception. The birth uh, actually was probably pretty ordinary, except for who was being born. So that's one thing. But you know, one of the other things I've, I've always said is that you know, Christmas comes once a year. It's a great holiday. We, you know, we celebrate the birth of, uh, of Jesus, but that you know, the Easter and Good Friday are every day for us because you know, that's, that's our life. That's our eternal life. That's our forgiveness. And I still hold to that, uh, but if you were to say to somebody, you know what, Christmas is more than just about the birth of Jesus. You, know, you might get some odd looks from Christians, but yet it's true because there's more to it than that. And it's, it's almost asking the question, why did God do it this way? Why did he do it the way he did? Why did Jesus you know, have to become human? Why did he have to go through this particular uh, chain of events and chain of uh, command, if you will, to, uh, to do everything he did. So I want to do a quick study on the incarnation, uh, you know, the doctrine of it, how it came about, uh, the deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the, the reasons for why Jesus did what he did, why God exercised this plan, and the characteristics of the humanity of, of Jesus Christ. And so we start with um, John's gospel. Now what's interesting is, is that uh, you, know, you look at all the, the genealogies in the gospels and every, all the gospels have you know, their own, I don't wanna say point of view, but their own, their own task, okay? So Matthew, for example, Matthew, his slant in the, in, the, in the gospels is to show Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy. So Matthew is looking at this from a highly Jewish perspective. So he starts his genealogy where? With, with Abraham, okay, that's where he starts. Now Luke is focusing more, his slant is a little bit more on the humanity of Jesus. He's the, he's the physician. So where does Luke start his genealogy? With Adam. Mark portrays, or again, not portrays, but he, the, the angle on the gospel is to show Jesus as human, the suffering servant, a servant of all of us. There's no genealogy in Mark, but then again, who has a genealogy if they're a servant, right? You know, you look back and all the times, who, who cares about the servants? There's, they're not important enough, as it were, to have a genealogy. But then you get to John's gospel and, and, and you know, the scholars and theologians would say, well, John's job his slant is to show Jesus as the Son of God, to show his deity. So it's interesting that John has kind of a genealogy in his gospel, but it's kind of a divine genealogy, okay? Just the way it, it, it starts off. And this is where we start to get the flavor of really what Christmas is all about because of not just the birth of Jesus, but what it, and it, we know what it means ultimately but again, why did God choose to do it this way? So let's just start in John's gospel. I'm only going to read a few verses, so it's not necessary to turn to it. But um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's, it's one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture, and it's so much is condensed in that short little space there. But in the beginning was the Word. Again, the Word is the term logos. We've, I've talked about this probably the last three weeks now, but the logos, everything is tied into who Jesus is. All reason for everything, no matter what you can think of, love and logic and relationships and meaning and deity and everything is subsumed 
That's what logos means. That's the reason for all of it. And so God is telling us in his word that Jesus is, who, that's who that is. He's the logos. So there's a separation there as we read that we, we, we hear about God, but then we hear about God. And that's what's so interesting too. And the word was with God. Okay, so there's a, there's shows this distinction. This is another one of the many verses where you get hints of the Trinity. Okay, it's right here. And the word was God. So now you've got, you've got Christ being mentioned as being the Logos and everything that that means. That's deity. But then you've got the fact that his, there is a, you know, a separate personality, if you will. That's what we believe about the Trinity. One God revealed in three persons. And that uh, Jesus is separate in that sense. Uh, but that he's also God. That he's also God. But the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the incarnation. That is Christmas. The word, God, became flesh. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at some verses here that will you know, sort of get into um, the doctrine of the incarnation. Because you've heard the term, right, that Jesus is God incarnate. Okay, well, that's what that means. That's the incarnation. He took on humanity. He didn't lose his deity. Okay, so he's fully man, fully God. But this process occurred for many reasons, which we're going to get into right now. So let's go to Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who, through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Philippians 2, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay? So, Jesus is fully God, he's fully man, but yet the deity that he had, he, he, he stepped out of eternity, he sort of he didn't give up his deity, but there was things that he, I suppose, dialed back or turned, turned down, if you will. He, he, he had to live as a man in order to make all of this work, this whole idea of salvation work. First Timothy, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. This is beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. Hebrews 2, 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This is astonishing stuff. This is Christmas, folks. It's the baby in the manger, yes. It's, it's all those lovely songs that we sing, yes. But the Word became flesh. He took on this human form for all of these uh, reasons we see in Scripture how God is building this, how God is expressing exactly why He's doing what He's doing. These verses are a foundation for that as we go forward. So... The next thing, so that's the doctrine of it. That's the doctrine of the, of the incarnation. We could look to a lot of other verses too, but I think those are the main ones that clearly show Jesus is God, Jesus is man. God, man, the God, man, okay? All right, so now the means of the incarnation um, was the Holy Spirit. That's pretty obvious, right? There's not a lot of uh, you know, uh, searching that needs to happen there. It was the Holy Spirit. Um, his deity didn't need to be generated, but his humanity did. 
And so the Holy Spirit, obviously, was the, the person in the Trinity who, uh, who was able to appoint that humanity through this miraculous uh, conception. And so we have verses like Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Little King James there for you this morning. But uh, you see, again, in that verse, there's so much packed in there. Not only are we talking about the birth of the Savior, we're talking about the seed of the woman, which the seed comes from the man, but in this case, it's the woman. It means it's going to be a virgin birth. I mean, there's so much packed in here. It talks about the sin problem and how it's going to be fixed, but that the devil would eventually be put asunder. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, so there we go again. I mean, that's just another beautiful verse. It's a Christmas verse we're familiar with, but it is the means of this incarnation. It is a virgin birth that God himself is responsible for bringing about, okay? Now, I want to... You know, I, I studied this from, uh, from Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, and I'm, I'm, you know, he, I'm going to go a little bit in a different order than, than he kind of laid it out uh, because I'm, I'm going to save the best for last, really, the best part of this for last. Uh, I think the deity of Jesus is, you know, uh, is beyond question in the New Testament. He, Jesus says he's the Lord of the Sabbath. I and the Father are one. Uh, the word was God, okay? So there's no question the deity of Jesus, not only how others referred to him, but how he referred to himself, right? So there's no doubt about the deity of the Messiah. Even though he was born in the manger, he was born of the virgin and so on and so forth, he is still fully God, and that is made manifest throughout the Old and the New Testament. Not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Um, you know, think about Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay? So, once again, these are terms of deity associated with this baby being born. Okay? So the deity of Jesus is, is you know, beyond, uh, beyond uh, questioning. Um, the humanity of Jesus, well, he, he had a human form, right? He looked like a man. Uh, he had a human birth. He had human ancestry, uh, human names. Uh, he was referred to others by human as being a human. He referred to himself as being human. Um, he had human development. He was a baby. He grew up. He learned, you know, little things along the way. <laughs> Uh, he had human experiences, right? I mean, he was tired, he got hungry, uh, he felt pain, you know, so he had human experiences. Uh, I'm sorry? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know what else? He had human death. He had human death. So the humanity of Jesus Christ is really, um, you know, again, not in question. Not in question. His humanity is not in question. His deity is not in question. Okay? So we keep going. Uh, what about his character, the character of the incarnate Messiah? The character of the incarnate Messiah. Holy, sinless, loving, humble, meek, prayerful. And he was an incessant worker. Uh, Fruchtenbaum says an incessant, an incessant worker. Those are all examples for one of the big things we'll get into right at the end here about the reasons for the incarnation, the reason and purpose of why God did things this way. But these characteristics lay the groundwork for an example for how we should live, okay? Uh, the humiliation of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He stepped out of eternity. He stepped out of glory for us. Um, he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. The likeness. Not, he didn't take on sinful flesh. The likeness 
of sinful flesh. Uh, he was born in poverty, right? He wasn't born, you know, like, oh, this is the Messiah. Let's make a way for him. Let's give him a big, you know, welcome and, a, you know, all riches. No, he was born into poverty, uh, born under the law. Um, he, he had limited power in a sense, uh, but that's by the term kenosis in the, and again, limited power, not because it was something, well, he just lost it. It was something that was, I, th I think, purposely, uh, you know, dialed back. He, he gave up, you know, he didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped, so he took on the form of a, of a, of a man, and, uh, you know, he didn't utilize all his godly power, obviously, okay? Uh, he, he suffered uh, the miseries of life. He became a servant. Um, he became sin. He became sin. He bared the cross. And then death. And burial. So the humiliation of Jesus, what he had to do to make all of this possible for us was to humiliate himself basically by all these steps, stepping out of perfection, stepping out of glory and into this humiliation. Um, but now I want to get into the reasons for the incarnation, the reasons for it. Uh, and there's several. The first one is to seek and save that which is lost, right? No surprise there. But that's the reason for it. Um, one of the purposes was for Jesus to reveal God to man. They said, show us the Father. And he says, you see me, you've seen the Father. Okay? And once again, I always come back to this, folks, and we can never forget this, that none of this should have been a surprise because if you believe in God's word and you believe in God's character and you believe that he communicates a message to us and you look at that message and it says all of these things about the Messiah and then this man comes who starts to fulfill them, doesn't anybody stop and take a quick second and say, hey, wait a minute, you know? Knowing God is not a liar, might this be the Messiah? But, the, you know, see, and, and it happens with us, too. You get so wrapped up in your own thing. You get so wrapped up in your own uh, emotions and troubles or jealousies or, um, or, or, or plans or, you know, uh, goals or whatever it is uh, that you forget about just the simple things. God exists. He is communicated. He's communicated to us truthfully. That's what you can count on. And that's why when you read the Bible and you read about fulfillment of prophecy, you have to look first up here. Not at the scholars and all this. Look at God. Say, what is God telling us? Wow, God doesn't lie. God's not out to trick us. He said that, that uh, the Messiah would be born a virgin. Well, Jesus was born a virgin, you know. He said he would do miracles. Well, Jesus did that. He did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. It's all there. It's all there. How do you miss it? You only miss it if your heart isn't right. You only miss it if your personal goals or your personal uh, grievances or whatever it is out what the overarching truth is. And again, you know, I can, we can beat up on the Pharisees all day long, but I think we can look in the mirror too. I know I can. You know, and sometimes you just, you just forget. Um, but he provided an example of living, we we listed those characteristics of all those things, um, you know, his humility, his love, his forgiveness, his holiness, his sinlessness, his his working, his not giving up, being prayerful, and so on and so forth. Those are examples for us for how to live. Uh, remember, Jesus had these temptations; he had all these things, and he never sinned. He never sinned. Um, he was the sacrifice for our sin. All our sin was placed on him. He took the punishment um, that we deserve. He took it. And folks, that makes me stop here and want to really just kind of reflect on something because uh, it really hit me a few months ago. And, you know, we can look at all these things in kind of a, a cold theological way. 
You know, we can understand intellectually the theology of it, and that is vital. I'm not downplaying it at all. We have to understand the, the intellectual, logical basis and the theology of what we're taught, okay? But sometimes, you know, we get all the place, pieces in place, and we understand it, but then we forget about, you know, the bigger picture, or we forget about the emotional impact, okay? And the emotional impact, emotions are fine as long as they're not separated from truth, right? So when we talked about this a couple of months ago, you know, you look down this list and you see all these things, and it's like, yeah, okay, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, yeah, that makes sense. But let's dial it down just a minute. Remember when I, I talked about, um, you know, have you ever been in a position where you see somebody hurting, you see somebody in pain, and they can't do anything about it, they can't fix it, and you say, if I could fix this, I would. You say to yourself, you say as a father, as a brother, as a friend, as a husband, as a wife, whatever, if I could take this from you, I would put it on myself because I love you so much. I know you can't fix this. I know you can't get better. I know you can't do this. I want to do it. And we mean that. We're sincere about it. That's that love that we feel that we have. Well, folks, God has it at a cosmic level. And so when God says it, he means it. He says, you know, again, all these things we're going through down these bullet points, they're all valid bullet points. We need to keep them in perspective and, and understand them. But at the end of the day, let's take a step back and say, this isn't just some cold exercise where Jesus is like, well, okay, I got to do this. And I go, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. The passion that he must have for us is unreal. To look down on us and say, I love you. What a mess you've made. What a mess you've made of yourselves, of this world, and yet I love you. The only way it's going to be fixed is if I fix it. And so I'm going to fix it in a way that is the only way, because God doesn't like, he's not looking at a bunch of rival choices and saying, well, let's try this. No, it's the only way. God himself stepping out of eternity, stepping out of glory, taking on human flesh, to live, as, live a perfect, sinless life, and to bear our sins in his body, give us his righteousness. God is doing this, again, not just as a theological exercise, but as an ultimate act of love for us, who, again, it's not just some distant love. It's not just, you know, we check all the boxes and understand how theologically it all works. Imagine the love that God must have for us to do this. It, you know, and I think sometimes when we just stop and think for a second, it really, really hits home. And so, you know, I, I hope it does with you. So he came to seek and save that which was lost, to reveal God the Father to people, to be an example for living, sacrifice for sin. You know, animal blood could never do it. Human blood couldn't do it, but something better than human blood, the blood of Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. We read about that in Genesis 3.15. He became our merciful high priest. Um, he came to fulfill the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant, remember, there was a lot of things that God promised to Abraham, who, you know, he said, this is what's going to happen with you, with your people, with this nation. It's going to affect the whole world. You're going to have this kind of a parcel of land. You're going to have this, 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 and this. God swore by himself to make it happen. One of the conditions of that, too, is what we call the Davidic covenant, that the Messiah would rule and reign on David's throne forever. So in order to fulfill the Davidic covenant, you need somebody who can do that forever, and the Messiah is Jesus Christ. So he came to fulfill the Davidic covenant. He came to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies, right? How else do we know what's what? is that we look at God's word and we say, what does it say? What's actually happened in history? And you connect the dots like God would have us do because we're not stupid. We're not necessarily the most brilliant people in the world. We're flawed. 
But God still expects us to understand these things. He held people accountable to know. You didn't recognize the time of your visitation, Jesus said to the Pharisees and to a lot of the Jews. Everything that was written about me, I'm here. I could do so much for you, and you're not willing, right? He came to be highly exalted, which meant he stepped down. That was the descent, but then he's exalted. He goes back up. He here restored dominion to the earth. God made man to have dominion over the earth, but Satan stole it. When we read, again, there's nothing in the Bible that's an afterthought. We read uh, Ruth, and we talk, we read, understand about the redemption of the land and how important that was in the Jewish culture and how, you know, Boaz was able to redeem the land for Naomi and, and so forth. This is exactly what Jesus does for us. He redeems the earth gives it back to man. That's what the scroll is in John, in, the Re in Revelation, where John's weeping because there was nobody worthy to open the scrolls. And the angel said, no, there is. And it's the Messiah who gives the title deed of the earth back to man. That's what that's all about. He came to bring many sons to glory, just like the song says, how deep the Father's love. And I love this too to deliver believers from their fear of death, just like it said in Hebrews. Um, no one likes to talk about that. No one likes to think about it, I'm sure. But at the same time, folks, we don't have to fear. Because Jesus came down and he lived this life. He went through all this. He understands our suffering because he suffered more than any of us. And I, and I mean that. I remember I got so angry one time uh, that, uh, you remember Andrew Greeley? Okay, he's phony, just absolute phony uh, individual. And he was talking against capital punishment and he, he talked about Jesus and he said, and you know, people will say that Jesus suffered more than someone going to the electric chair. I guess that remains arguable. And it was a good thing, I, well, you know, anyway, I, I, I can tend to get, you know, Christy and I were talking about that the other day, how do, you, how, how do you get slow to anger? And I just said, I guess it just takes practice, you know, stop and think before you say something. Because um, sometimes, you know, I, I, I can just blow, and that's not good. Um, and I think if Andrew Greeley had been in the room with me, uh, I'd have been in jail. No, no, no. no I, I, I don't, I don't mean that. But, but anyway, I, you know, I wrote him a, a scathing letter and sent it in. I never heard back. Uh, but, um, folks, when Jesus was born, as soon as he, you know, when he was 12 years old, he was teaching in the temple. Where have you been? His mother said, "Don't you know I have to be about my father's business? His father's business." His father's business isn't, you know, how many widgets he's going to make and what's the, what's the production cost and the shipping costs and then how much are we going to charge to make a product? No, his father's business is our salvation. Amen. Teaching people, I'm the promised Messiah, okay? God made all these prophecies. He said that he was going to save mankind. He made promises to you, Israel. He's about his father's business. So Jesus, from the time he was a little boy, he had a death sentence hanging over him the entire time. Think about that. Jesus had a death sentence on him as soon as he was old enough to understand that part as he developed. Imagine that, walking through this life and knowing that, you know, age 33, I'm going to die. Now, cer certainly he knew he'd be resurrected, but folks... We're talking about something that was so horrendous and so beyond the pale of anything we can identify with. I think we can clearly say that Jesus Christ suffered more than any person ever, ever. Not only for the length of time, what was hanging over him, 
to know that the physical abuse, how awful that was. But then the cross, how awful that was. And then to bear our sins in his body, how awful that was. So he suffered more than any of us. So he understands. And so when we think of Jesus going through all this, uh, because of his love for us, and then coming out of that tomb, it rescues us from our fear of death. It should, anyway. Again, you know, we're still human. We're still in this, in this body. We're still in this world. And so things aren't as easy as we'd like them to be. But folks, if we don't have that, have that internal fortitude of biblical knowledge, and, and again, not just the knowledge of it, but the overall impact of it, God exists. He's given us a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ, and we belong to him. We don't have to fear death, okay? Um, so that's what Christmas really is. I mean, the incarnation, it, it, so it's more than just the birth of Jesus. It's why he had to be born at all. You know, why God chose to do it this way, and there's so many reasons. Because it had to be a, sin, a human but sinless sacrifice. It had to be the blood of Jesus. It had to be an example that Jesus could lay forth. It had to be all these things. And two quick things as I close here. Um, first thing is, the more I study the Bible, the more blown away I am by it. Now listen, when we talk about God's existence, we talk about how we can know the Bible is God's word. I'd love to sit down and talk to anybody about that because I love the evidence. It's so cool. I love it. There's so much. And not that I want to get into a debate with anybody, but if anybody wants to, it's like, okay, I'll do it lovingly. I'll do it lovingly. You got an intellectual argument? Okay, let's hear it. I want to hear what you have to say. So that's, that, that, part's, that part's all good part's all good. But when I just look at the words that are in this book, mankind cannot come up with this stuff. And I'm not talking about the fulfilled prophecy and the writing history in advance. That's, that's an obvious one. I'm talking about just the overall content, the design, the integration, the concepts, the arc, the breadth, all of these things. No one of a worldly mindset could ever you have to this has to be true in order for it even to be written it's sort of a self-affirming thing does that make sense it's so wonderful it is so intricate in its in its physical makeup but also in its concepts no one who is trying to pull a fast one on the world or trying to keep people you know uh, putting the money in the in the in the in the plate uh, can come up with something so beautiful so sound this is an incredible work that God has given us, not only in all of those evidences we like to talk about, but just the very nature of it and the fact that knowing that God exists, he is of the ultimate character, the ultimate in holiness, and he gives us a word that we can count on. I just find that to be beautiful. And finally, um, you know, as you study, you know, sometimes you get... Again, it, it becomes, uh, you know, you're, you're studying, you're, you're gathering facts, you're gathering perspective because you want to share it, whether it's a home Bible study or whether it's a sermon uh, or whether you're just learning on your own, you know. Um, and I remember listening to this theologian one time, he said that what he does sometimes just as a little game, and not a bad game, but just a game, he said, He'll, you know, leave his computer aside, leave his cell phone aside. He'll just go into his library or whatever, and he'll pull the actual Bible off the shelf. And he says, and I play a little game with myself where I pretend it's the first time I'm ever reading it. Because that awe, that beauty that you see when you read about Christ I remember when I first came back to the Lord and I was reading the epistles, every time Paul would say, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That just got me because it's such a beautiful name. And this man actually was an eyewitness of his majesty. I met Peter, not Paul, but Paul could, you know, the same thing. Um, but as you go along, you know, you, 
you, you sort of get into a grind and, and you forget about just little things. And then every once in a while, something will hit you. And I'm almost glad it does because this is really what it's all about. I'm listening to an audio book uh, by a guy named Eric Metaxas. It's called Is Atheism Dead? And it's, it's, it's really, I listened to it, you know, uh, on the way back from uh, Pennsylvania. And the only thing I don't like about it is that he, you know, he's assuming billions of years, which, you know, okay, I don't, I don't particularly care for that. But the rest of the book is just really well-researched and, and very important. But he, he told the story in the Bible about when Peter and James and John are in the boat and Jesus says, hey, you know, throw your nets on the other side because they weren't getting any fish. Throw your nets on the other side. Okay, we'll do it because you say so, but we've been out here all night. It ain't going to work, but we'll do it because you say so. So Peter, you know the story, he throws his net on the other side of the boat and he brings in more fish than they could ever imagine. And what does Peter do? He falls down at Jesus' feet. And he says, Master, depart from me because I'm a sinful man. What a, what a weird thing to say, right? That's such a weird thing to say. Instead of saying, Lord, oh, thank you for all these fish. It's like, no, we're in the presence of God. And, and his sin was so immediately exposed in the presence of Jesus. That's all Peter could think to say. Lord, depart from me because I'm a sinful man. But then what happens three years later, and this is what really got me, three years later, after the resurrection, guys are out there all night again, nothing going on. All of a sudden, this man standing on the shore, hey, try to throw your net on the right side. All right. And then when they do, they pull up all this fish, the nets, nets are breaking, the boat's sinking. And what did Peter do? <laughs> he knew. He knew who it was. And what did he do? He jumped out of the boat and swam like a madman to meet his Savior. And that's what I think is good for all of us, right? I'm sorry, I don't mean to get... <laughs> so that just really got me. Though. It just totally caught me off guard when I was listening to that the other day. It's just, it's like every once in a while, you know, you, you hear something like that, and it's just boom. And sometimes that gets lost when you're, you know, you're, you're just, you're going about the business of church. And when I, when I heard that, it just, it just gave me such joy, such peace. That's really what it's all about. All these things, yes. But you imagine that day when we run to meet our Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for a closing prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your love. Lord, there's just so many things we could say, Lord, but a simple thank you with reverence, with worship, and with humility, Lord, we, we thank you for your love and look forward to that glorious day when we'll see you face to face, Lord. What a, what a promise, what a, what a hope, and not a blind hope. Just faith in the future tense, a certainty of something that's about to happen. That's what hope is. And we thank you for it, Lord. Uh, we ask that you bless us as we go our separate ways here today and uh, keep us strong, healthy, and safe, dear Lord God. And we thank you uh, for your love and for the power of the Holy Spirit and, Lord, this uh, ability to serve you while we're still here. Help us do it right, do it well, and give you the glory. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here today, Lord. We love you, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.